Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Disaster Scenarios webinar series. My name is Erica Podest, and I'm, I will be your instructor for today's webinar. Uh, the material for this series has been assembled with the help of Elizabeth Hook, Sean McCartney, and Amita Mehta. This is the second of a three-part Disaster Scenario webinar series. Today's webinar is focused on flooding, and the third webinar is focused on landslides and earthquakes, and that one will take place on Tuesday, April 30th. As part of today's webinar, I will be showing you different data sets available to monitor floods and support decision-making activities. All of the different data products that will be discussed in this webinar are freely available. The training objectives of this webinar are to identify NASA remote sensing or modeled data relevant to flooding, as well as other remote sensing and modeled data sets. Identify data that allows you to monitor conditions before, during, and after a storm or a flood, and to understand how remote sensing data can be used in decision-making activities. So we will discuss the remote sensing data sets available for tracking these events, their characteristics, and how to access and interpret them. Every organization or agency can have different decision-making timeline through the phases of mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. So hopefully, the breadth of resources we cover in each one of these sessions will be helpful given the spatial and temporal nature in which you need to operate in your work. Flooding impacts. According to the Munich Reinsurance Group, which is one of the world's leading insurance companies, floods were by far the most frequent cause of natural disasters between 1995 and 2015. Worldwide, about a third of all reported events and a third of economic losses resulting from natural catastrophes are attributable to floods. The United Nations reports that flooding has accounted for nearly half of all weather-related disasters worldwide since 1995 and has killed an estimated 157,000 people and affected some 2.3 billion others. The report also indicated that flood trends are affecting larger areas and are becoming more severe. This chart shows flood fatalities in the U.S. over the last 30 years. It does not include hurricane-related flooding. In August of 2016, prolonged rainfall resulted in catastrophic flooding in the state of Louisiana. Thousands of houses and businesses were submerged. Louisiana's government called the disaster a historic, unprecedented flooding event and declared a state of emergency. 13 deaths resulted from that particular event and an estimated $10 billion in damages. In the world's largest coastal cities alone, if flood protection measures are not implemented, flood damages could amount to $1 trillion per year by 2050. More detailed information on monitoring floods for flood management can be obtained from RCET's advanced webinar series, uh, which took place in March 2016. Also of relevance is the introductory webinar on applications of remote sensing to soil moisture and evapotranspiration from September 2016. Both of these webinars can be accessed through these links listed here, uh, and they are free. Today's webinar is structured such that we will discuss data products available for ad addressing questions before, during, and after a flood, such as what are the areas at risk for flooding? This is important to know before the flood occurs in order to help mitigate the problems or deploy resources to the areas that are most likely to flood, since once the event occurs, mobility and deployment becomes much more difficult. How can flood risk maps be supplemented or complemented with satellite data 
This is also another layer of information that helps pinpoint areas that are even more likely to flood based on the characteristics of the storm or event and its path. What, are, what areas are currently flooded? This information is relevant during and after the event. How fast is the water rising, receding? This is also information that is relevant during the event and after the event. What is the information or what is the flood extent? This is very important to know uh, during and after the event. And what is the flood damage? Obviously, th so this is a, an after the event assessment of the damage that the flood has caused. And this is in part determined by the extent of the flood. So we'll start with the description of flood risk maps. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, is a U.S. agency that provides flood maps to communities to provide accurate flood hazard and risk data and guide them to mitigation actions. So this uh, chart on the right shows how these maps are created. First, a watershed is selected, and then different products are used to generate the flood risk maps. These products can be hydrological related products, such as maps of the river, rivers and lakes, elevation maps, river flow, river flood line, infrastructure within the area, land use, and existing maps such as um, uh, uh, base maps of floodplain dele delineation. Ground data from in-situ sensors or historic flood related data are also available and they provide valuable layers of information for producing the flood risk maps. These maps are then validated through local knowledge and meetings with state, local, and tribal officials to identify areas more prone to flooding. The final part of this process is for community leaders to inform the local residents and communities the current risk of flooding. These maps are reviewed regularly and updated when needed, depending on factors such as population growth and development, better information uh, for enhanced characterization of the area, as well as changing environmental conditions. So one thing to keep in mind about this product is that it only covers the United States. Here we have an example of the type of information that these flood risk maps provide. This example covers part of the city of Houston, the city of Galena Park, Pasadena, and unincorporated areas of Harris County in Texas in the United States. The yellow lines indicate the different jurisdiction boundaries within this area. The scale on the right provides an explanation of the colors. The most important thing to note is that the main river channel that you're seeing here through the middle of uh, the image here, um, that is marked with red stripes and that indicates that this is the regulatory floodway. The cyan colored areas, primarily around that main river channel, are flood hazard areas or areas that are most likely to flood. While the orange areas, are areas that are the, the next most likely to flood. So for global risk maps, the World Resources Institute has an Aqueduct Global Flood Analyzer. It's a web-based interactive platform that measures river flood impacts by urban damage, affected GDP, and affected population at the country, state, and river basin scale across the globe. It's an open access tool and it is free of charge. So the analyzer enables users to estimate current flood risk for a specific geographic unit, taking into account existing local flood protection levels. It also allows users to project future flood risks with three climate and socioeconomic change scenarios which can help decision makers quantify flood damage and cost benefit analysis when evaluating and financing risk mitigation and climate adaptation projects. The users can assess these flood risks um, 
uh, under current conditions and in the future up to 2030. And so here I'm going to show you an example. If you go to that website on the PowerPoint, um, you'll go to the analyzer, the global flood analyzer. And here we have an example of Tanzania. So the scale on the right indicates current probability of inland flooding for any given year. The dark blue areas have a risk of greater than 20% flooding. The window on the left shows flood risk according to urban damage, affected GDP, and population. So you've got different options here, affected GDP, urban damage, okay? And if we look at affected population, it indicates that a five-year flood has a 20% probability of occurring for any given year. So if we go If we look at this point right here, there's a 20% probability of a flood occurring for any given year. And this could cost roughly um, seven, 722.9 thousand people to be affected. And so if we look at the 10 year flood has a 10% probability of occurring in any given year and could cost 857.4 thousand uh, people to be affected. So uh, this is a very uh, interesting and important information on uh, the probability of floods, um, at the magnitude of the floods, and the population affected. And then down here, you have the different scenarios. And you can read further if you put your mouse over each of these scenarios, you can read uh, specifically what each scenario is about. So for example, scenario C is future um, change taking into account climate change and socioeconomic change. So it takes into account severe climate change and uncontrolled population growth and fragmented economies. So it'll project up to 2030 and it'll uh, provide an estimate of the expected affected population, which in this case would be 99.6 thousand. So this is a global tool, uh, freely available and a really, really great resource. Okay, so we'll go back to our PowerPoint presentation. Uh, there's also the Aqueduct Water Risk Atlas, which is slightly different. And that we can see right here. It's an online mapping tool that lets users combine 12 key indicators of water risk to create global overall water risk maps. Again, this is an example over Tanzania, what we're seeing here showing overall water risk. And it identifies areas with higher exposure to water-related risks and is an aggregated measure of all selected indicators from the physical quantity, quality, and regulatory reputational risk categories listed here on the left-hand side. Okay, so now we'll discuss identifying infrastructure at risk. And there are different sites where you can pull information that is relevant to identify infrastructure at risk. Um, for example, uh, you can access um, elevation maps from SRTM or AstroDM, as well as socioeconomic data. Um, and the CDEC website has products on man-made impervious surface and settlement extent. And these products are generated from Landsat and are, are available at 30 meter spatial resolution globally. So you can download, download these data for free. Yeah, you'll need an account. Uh, 
But once you have a, you establish an account through username and password, you can access all of this data. And then you can import this data into QGIS to identify areas that are susceptible to flooding. So let's go through this example. Uh, let's start with downloading an SRTM digital elevation model at one arc second. So first thing you do is you log into NASA's Earth Data Search Engine, uh, which you can access through the link listed here. And so in this example, uh, we'll go, we're at the Earth Data Search Engine and we will type SRTM one arc second in the search box up here. And you hover your mouse over the rectangle here and select rectangle. And then you input the coordinates of interest. So we are interested in downloading a DM over this Houston area. And we are going to input the coordinates listed here, 27.5 degrees to minus uh, um, latitude, minus 97.5 degrees longitude and 30.5 latitude to minus 89.5 longitude to define the size of our uh, rectangle, those corner coordinates. Okay, southwest and northeast coordinates. And then you select the NASA shuttle radar topography mission global one arc second version three product. So one arc second is about uh, 30 meters. And this is a global product. And you'll have 24 granules. So you select download, download all. And in the next window, select direct download and submit. So here's a link so you can download each of your files. And once you have them on a folder in your computer, then you can open them into the uh, whatever GIS software you use, whether it's QGIS or ArcGIS or um, Envy, you can open them and create a seamless mosaic of your DEM. So in this example, we've done this using QGIS. And we've color coded the, the mosaic such that areas that are dark blue are areas with lower elevation and areas that are um, lighter blue are areas of higher elevation. Okay, so now we will download the impervious surface data that's through the NASA's uh, Socioeconomic Data and Application Center, CDAC. Again, uh, you need to have an account. If you don't have one, you can create one and in order to download the data. Okay, so let's go to the browser. And what you'll do is you'll select impervious surface percentage here the first product and you download view right here select download view okay and then you select tile by tile Download by tiles. 
Okay. And since we're interested in the Houston, Texas area, we will select tiles 14R and 15R, these two. So when you click on the tile, a window pops up and you pick the layer impervious surface percentage, GMIS, GMIS, and you save it. So in order to save it, another window pops up and you actually click on the file name in order to download it. And you go through the same process for that second tile, 15R. Okay, so you've, uh, you bring this as a, another layer into your uh, QGIS or whichever software uh, platform you use. And you overlay these two data sets to identify areas that are most likely to flood because they are lower in elevation and or flat together with the infrastructure that is located um, that would define, or, or the most impermeable surfaces, that would define the most vulnerable areas um, for flooding. Okay, so you can combine this type of information to really identify areas that are most vulnerable. And so here we have a zoomed version of the previous chart. This is the Houston area in Texas. And it shows lower elevation, darker blue for SRTM, and different levels of impervious surfaces. Okay, so the more impervious the surface, the darker it is. So the, the, the dark purple is, uh, or black is the most impervious. And we can see that the, the roads are black. Um, we can see the network of roads here within the Houston area. Um, and so here we have an even more zoomed in uh, version of the previous chart. This is uh, Galveston Island here. And you can appreciate a larger level of detail and the extent of the impervious surfaces in this small area. Okay, so next we will discuss assessing soil moisture as another indicator to help determine areas at risk for flooding. Uh, flood severity can be impacted by how wet soils are before a rainstorm. If we know that soils are near saturation and that a large rainstorm is uh, moving in, then we, we can predict that that area might be at risk for flooding. So high, high soil moisture can increase the chance of inundation and the National Weather Service flash flood guidance is updated at least every 24 hours based on surface soil moisture. There's a satellite in space, it's a NASA satellite, it's called SMAP, which stands for Soil Moisture Active Passive, and it makes measurements of soil, surface soil moisture globally every three days. So I'll be describing that in a bit more detail in the following charts. So SMAP measures moisture in the top five centimeters of the soil. It uses a microwave remote sensing instrument. And uh, there are several products that are uh, generated. Uh, one is a surface soil moisture. And this is a result of direct observations of the sensor, of the microwave sensor. There's also a root zone soil moisture product which is at one meter depth. And this is an estimate calculated using a land surface model. So the microwave signal cannot, that SMAP uses, the frequency, um, cannot penetrate that deep into the soil. And therefore, a land surface model is needed in order to estimate soil moisture at a depth of one meter at the root zone level. So both the surface soil moisture and root zone soil moisture products are available at 9 and 36 kilometer resolutions. And SMAP has been collecting data, soil moisture data, 
globally since April of 2015 through present, and the data are freely available online. You can access map data through the Worldview server listed here on the left, or through the National Snow and Ice Data Archive Center link listed on the right. And the nice thing about the Worldview server is that you can actually you can also visualize the data. So I'll show you how to visualize and download SMAP data through Worldview. Okay, and we'll go here. And what you do is, uh, first of all, you need to have an account to download the data. And in order to access map data and visualize it, you go to Worldview and Add Layers. And a window will pop up with different hazards. You select floods and click on the dot, dot, dot here at the bottom to see the entire list of flood related uh, products. And scroll down and select soil moisture. There are a number of different soil moisture products derived from different sensors. And what we'll do is we'll select the SMAP soil moisture product. So go to SMAP radiometer. And on the right, you have different options. And you'll select the SMAP level three passive day product. Okay. SMAP level three passive day nine kilometer product and orbital tracks, just the descending day. And we'll also select the root zone soil moisture product. And to do that, select SMAP model value added. And in the options on the right, select the root zone soil moisture nine kilometer level four, 12 Zulu instantaneous. And then close this window up here. And we'll visualize the data. So in order to, uh, so we've got the two data sets here on our overlay list. And if you want to turn that off, you click on the eye and you can turn that on or off. Okay, so as default, we've got uh, coastlines and we've got some base layers corrected reflectance so let's turn off the base layer and let's turn off the orbital track of SMAP and then let's turn on the soil moisture nine kilometer product let's turn this one off and you can select for which day you want to visualize it. Okay, so right now we're visualizing it for a given day here. March 8th. Okay, and so remember, we don't have full global coverage on a daily basis. Every three days we cover the entire globe. That's why for any given day you see these large gaps. And another thing that you can do is animate it. So if you want to see soil moisture animated, you can set up an animation and you define the time frame down here. So we'll go from, uh, let's go from uh, February 15th through March 15th of 2009, and then you press play. And you'll have a nice animation. So this is a nice visual. 
to really have an intuitive feel of how soil moisture is changing through time for a particular place of interest. Right, so you can zoom in and out here. So this is, remember, this is a nine kilometer resolution product. And we can also display the root zone soil moisture product. And again, you can also go through the same animation to see how that's changing through time. Okay, so this animation is just a very short time frame, but uh, you can animate uh, an entire uh, season or year, however you like. Okay, so downloading the data. So let's go select here. To download the data, you go up to this option up here on the main menu, data, data download. And it gives you the option to download the different, the data sets that you selected for your animation. So let's just select one of these. Actually, So we want to download a particular day. You can set the day down here. And you download one file. Again, and you go through the whole download process. Okay. Uh, again, you have to be logged in in order to download this data sets. So the SMAP Soil Moisture products are in HDF5 format. And HDF5 uh, can be open with QGIS, Panoply, HDF5, um, just to name a few. But most softwares, uh, uh, software packages recognize HDF5 formats. And uh, this is an example of a single file a global soil moisture file of um, for August 24th, 2017. Okay, and here is another example of SMAP soil moisture for the Houston, Texas area before and during Hurricane Harvey. And yellow means that uh, the soil moisture is low and blue means that soil moisture is high. So here soil moisture is measured, SMAP measures soil moisture as volumetric, meaning it's a measurement of the amount of water within a given volume of soil. And the, so the volume of water within a given volume of soil, and it's represented as um, meter cubed over meter cubed. And the city of Houston appears gray because there are no soil moisture retrievals in urban areas. By SMAP, the retrieval algorithm only works in natural habitats and therefore urban areas are massed out. So notice the large increase in soil moisture in the surroundings of Houston, of the Houston area before and after um, or during the hurricane. All right, so in the next section, I will be discussing uh, flooding. So how do we track flooding? The Global Flood Monitoring System, also known as GFMS, is a NASA-funded experimental system using real-time um, or using trim precipitation data as calibration and uh, real-time GPM data uh, precipitation information. And it's input into a hydrological runoff and routing model running on a 1 8 degree latitude longitude grid. The platform provides global maps, time series, and animations covering an area of 50 degrees north and 50 degrees south latitudes. So it's providing instantaneous rain rate every three hours with about a 10 hour latency. Okay, so uh, let's do a little demonstration here. I'll go to the link listed on the PowerPoint chart 
to the global flood monitoring system. And on the right, you have several tools. You can pan the map and you can zoom in and out. So let's pan and zoom to our area of interest, which is Houston, Texas. And let's zoom in. There and uh, down here, you can specify the lat and long for your point of interest. So let's just define our point of interest as 29 and a half and minus 95 and a half. 29 and a half. Um, and, and as soon as you move this cursor, back on the map, those the, your lat long will change. Okay, so it just just changed, but okay, let's just um, go down here and we what we really want to see is the changing the flood conditions during Hurricane Harvey. So Hurricane Harvey struck the Gulf area, specifically the Houston, especially the Houston area in August of 2017. So we will define our time frame of interest here to create an animation. And we'll start on August 20th, 2017. And we'll go through August 31st, 2017. And there are different uh, variables here that you can uh, plot and visualize, but for our case, we'll select um, flood detection depth. So there we go. And we're starting with 21 August 2017. So areas that are uh, yellow, orange, and red uh, means that uh, there is flooding in those areas. And you can see how it's changing as uh, the hurricane struck this area. So that's a great way to visualize the magnitude of the event and the extent of the flooding before, during, and after the hurricane. And another option from this tool is that you can forecast. You have the ability to forecast. And you can do that by selecting this next step option. So you can forecast a couple of, head, uh, of days ahead, up to five days ahead. Okay, so another product uh, that provides flood information, flood extent information, is a MODIS-based inundation flood mapping product. Um, MODIS is a sensor that's on board two satellites. It's uh, on board Aqua and on board Terra. And it provides observations one to two times per day. Um, there are certain bands that indicate water on previously dry surfaces. So there's a band uh, one, which goes from 620 to 670 nanometers, band two, and band seven. Um, so the water bodies are mapped with respect to a global reference database of water bodies. 
And motives, um, the caveat about motives is that it is an optical sensor and it cannot see the surface in the presence of clouds. So here, what we're seeing on the right are two figures from uh, MODIS. One is the MODIS sensor on board the Aqua satellite on Mar March 15th, 2016. And another, the one on the far right is from the MODIS sensor on board the Terra satellite on May 13, 2016. And this captures uh, um, flooding in the Mississippi River in 2016 extensive flooding. So the MODIS NRT global flood mapping product is based on MODIS reflectance and it its resolution is at 250 meters and it's composited at either two days, three days, and 14 days. The maps are available on 10 by 10 degree tiles and they delineate permanent and surface flood water. Uh, sometimes the caveat with these products is that sometimes cloud or terrain shadows can be misinterpreted as surface water. But this product provides near real time up to the previous day flood mappings since January of 2013. Okay, so if you click on the link for the NRT Global Flood Mapping product, you'll go to the page that has all the tiles and select the tile that covers the Houston area. And you'll go into this uh, window. And you can then define whether you want a flood product based on a one day composite, two day composite, three day or 14 day composite. And up here on the left of that window, on the upper left, you can define uh, your day of interest. So let's select August 17, 2017, 31, August 31, 2017, the two day composite. And you have a list of products that you can download. So the MODIS flood map is simply the annotated 10 by 10 degree tile graphic. Um, that's displayed on the website. The MODIS flood water, it removes the, um, the land-based water, the, the reference water, such that what's remaining is likely flood. So that's just indicating the areas that are flooded. The MODIS surface water is a product that indicates areas where there's water, there's land-based water observed at that time. And then the MODIS water product, that's a, a recently introduced product, uh, it's, uh, it has a, a, a number of different uh, pixel values. And one is um, indicating the user where there are clouds in the data where there's no water detected, where there's water detected that coincides with reference water, so it's not flood, and where there's water detected beyond surface water, so um, it may be flood. So basically, this water product displays everything that's above. It displays flood water and the reference water. And um, you can uh, these are different formats, but uh, you can download any of these uh, directly by clicking on the link. Okay, so there are several issues to keep in mind uh, with this product. Uh, one of them is that the product is at 250 meter resolution, so flooded features smaller than that will not be reliably detected. There are some issues with the georeferencing and there has been some inconsistency um, with uh, when comparing it with other data, including Landsat. And uh, then there's the issue of clouds. So MODIS cannot see through clouds and therefore unable to determine surface water extents when the area is cloudy. 
So it's uh, preferable that you use two, two days or three day composites to try to um, uh, circumvent this issue of cloud cover. Okay, and there are also cloud sh shadows and cloud shadows are spectrally similar to water and they can be flagged as water. So uh, the solution to this is to use the two-day composites. And so what you're seeing here is an example of uh, this particular tile over the Houston area for August of August 31, 2017. And the areas that are in red are areas that were uh, flooded. Okay, and um, the white areas are areas that are clouds. Uh, you can see some of these on the edges of the image. Uh, the blue area is reference water. Uh, and the gray are urban areas. Okay, another flood inundation product is the Dartmouth Flood Observatory, also known as DFO. And it uses flood mapping based on MODIS reflectance, um, of, of the same as MODIS NRT. And it also uses Landsat 8, uh, Earth Observation 1 images and Astro images, as well as Cosmos SkyMed and Sentinel-1 synthetic aperture radar images when available. So current flood events are analyzed not only using these multiple data sources, but they also integrate um, media reports. And here's an example of a DFO flood product. And this is flooding due to Hurricane Harvey. Uh, the red is indicates flooding, uh, while the blue indicates just uh, permanent water. And so you can see the, the massive uh, flooding surrounding the, in the Houston and surrounding areas as a result of Hurricane Harvey. So the final product that I wanna discuss or portal is the NASA Disasters Portal. And it has, uh, re disaster related information uh, such as floods and you can access this by clicking on disasters and then selecting floods so if you go to the NASA portal the link listed in the chart and you select disasters you can access disaster related information for different types of disasters. And if you go to floods, you can access flood specific disaster information for uh, related events. Okay, one last portal that I'd like to make you aware of is the ARIA um, a portal. And this is a portal that's based out of JPL that uses synthetic aperture radar to produce re disaster related information, including information about floods. And um, these are uh, flood proxy maps uh, derived from the Japanese PALSAR sensor, which is a, a, a SAR sensor operating at L band. And though these maps are not thoroughly uh, validated, they are produced as soon as possible after an event occur um, in order to serve as a guide. So the blue areas that you're seeing, um, this is again the Houston area using images before and after uh, Hurricane Harvey, uh, the blue areas indicate flooding. Another data set that is very valuable for detecting flooding is synthetic aperture radar. Uh, SAR, uh, also known as SAR, it's an um, active sensor operating in microwave frequencies. And the great advantage of SAR is that it can penetrate through clouds, through most weather conditions, and you can also observe the surface 
regardless of day or night. So it's really an ideal sensor to characterize flooding. Just because uh, flooding, when you have flood events, it, usually you have cloud cover. So uh, SAR is very sensitive to inundation. So to either open water, or that means water that has no vegetation over it, or inundated vegetation. So that's, you've got a, a, a standing water underneath the vegetation. It can characterize those two uh, very, very well. So there's radar data from different satellites. And what this chart shows are satellites that have flown in the past, currently flying, and that will fly. The satellites that have an, a red outline or, or have a box surrounding them means that the data is freely available. And so uh, back in 1978, there was CSAT. It flew for a couple of days, and that data is available through the Alaska Satellite Facility. This is an L-band SAR sensor. 2006-2011. ALOS-1 had a L-band SAR sensor. ALOS-1 was a Japanese satellite. And that data is available through the Alaska Satellite Facility. Currently, there's Sentinel-1. So there's Sentinel-1A and B. This is a C-band SAR sensor by the European Space Agency. And they, it has a, each, um, each satellite has a 12-day temporal repeat. So between the two of them, 1A and 1B, there's a six-day temporal repeat. Uh, the data is available through the Alaska Satellite Facility or through ESA's Copernicus Hub. And then in the future, there's a Canadian RCM. There's a NISAR uh, from it's a, a NASA um, Indian Space Agency joint venture. And there is a ESA's biomass mission. Um, both the, the last two are scheduled to launch in 2021 timeframe. SAR has many applications, including disaster monitoring. And this figure on the right shows a classification based on SAR observables, where we're classifying um, different land cover types within the image. Uh, one of the things that we can classify here very well are areas that are inundated. So the green represents non-inundated areas. These are forests. Yellow and orange is inundated vegetation. And then blue is open water. So that's uh, water where there's no vegetation over it. And as mentioned earlier, uh, microwave can see through clouds. It allows us to make measurements of the land surface, regardless of pretty much any type of weather condition. The uh, Sentinel SAR data is available through the Alaska Satellite Facility link that's listed here. And there's also a, uh, a software, a, a toolbox called SNAP that you can use to process Sentinel data. It's an open source toolbox and it's freely available and it can be downloaded through the link listed here. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a very useful uh, and complete uh, toolbox that was developed by ESA for processing primarily of uh, Sentinel data, including Sentinel-1 SAR data. So there was an R set a uh, webinar focused on processing of SAR data. And I encourage you to visit that webinar if you would like to learn more about SAR in general and how to uh, process the data and how to generate products related to land cover and flooding uh, and agriculture. So this webinar was hosted by our sets in July of 2018. So this is an example of Sentinel-1 SAR images. And we're looking at two images here before and after Hurricane Matthew, which is a, a massive hurricane that 
hit the coast of North Carolina of the United States. And so what you see here is uh, inundation extent due to this hurricane. So the orange areas along the coast are areas that have been inundated. So it's primarily inundated vegetation um, right all along here, this coast. And you also have an urban area here and the or orange areas are areas that are inundated uh, surrounding this urban center. So these SAR images, their original resolution, the, the, the uh, gridded resolution is uh, 10 meters, but after processing, it's actually about 50 meter resolution. So you can also access the Sentinel-1 database, the complete database on Google Earth Engine. And the nice thing about that is that these images are already processed. So they're really ready to be analyzed. And uh, here are the steps that have been applied to those data, that data sets that you can find on Google Earth Engine. So um, the, the, they, they've, there are a number of different steps, um, including radiometric and terrain corrections that have been applied to the data sets. And this is an example script for classifying flood extent with Sentinel-1. And it goes through different steps. So first you load the Sentinel-1 C-band data, and then you filter by date. So in this case, uh, this example is centered around the uh, floods in India in 2018 in, in uh, Kerala. And so we filtered uh, before the event and after the event. And then we applied, applied a, a threshold to identify flood, flooded areas, and then we displayed those. And here's the result of uh, running that script on Google Earth Engine. So we have a SAR image from before the event and a SAR image after the event, and we applied a threshold. So the blue areas that you see here are areas that were inundated. And finally, the last part of this webinar will discuss accessing products related to financial loss. The financial loss potential map index that we see here combines extent of flooding and debt information and overlays it with exposed property values located in the flooded areas. It represents the concentration of high flood hazard and or high value property locations at a grid level and can be used to validate loss estimates as well as review flood claims, for example. Uh, this example shows the financial loss potential index map for the city of Houston and surrounding areas as a result of Hurricane Harvey based on flood extent on August 27th and August 30th, 2017. And you can access this product through the NASA disasters portal that's listed here on the top. Now, these are not operational products, but these are products derived for uh, different disasters on an ad hoc basis. OK, so the GDAX is a, a, also known as the Global Disaster Alert and Coordination System, is a cooperation framework between the United Nations, the European Commission, and disaster managers worldwide to improve alerts information exchange and coordinations in the first phase after a major sudden onset uh, from a disaster. So here we have the GDAX portal and you have a map, a global map showing uh, different disasters that have occurred. So the figure on the icon represents the type of disaster, anywhere from uh, cyclones, volcanic eruptions, droughts, floods. And if you scroll down, 
you can access more information about that particular event. So let's uh, select uh, the floods in Mozambique. There are a number of products related to that event that are posted on the web page. Uh, as well as reports about current conditions. And then uh, finally, there's the International Charter Space and Major Disasters. So it's a worldwide collaboration to make satellite data available for disaster management. And it's composed of global space agencies and space system operators. So whenever a major disaster occurs, this international charter is activated. And these different state agencies provide data so that um, products can be um, derived and made available to the decision-making agencies. There are 34 contributing satellites. And you can find more information about the disaster charter uh, through the link listed here. And this is the main web page for the disasters charter. And they list the latest charter activations. And here you can obtain information that's been derived from different satellite sensors about specific disasters. So if we click here on floods in Indonesia, which occurred on 19 March of 2019, you'll go to an, a, a new window that will have a list of uh, the different products that have been generated using different sources to map the floods in Indonesia. And so, for example, we've got uh, products, flood mapping products generated from Pleiades, from ALOS 2, from RadarSat 2. And you can uh, freely access any of these products. As we've presented here today, there are many tools and data products that can be used in disaster management. There is no one correct way to use these tools in any one disaster scenario. Every organization or agency can have different decision-making timeline through the phases of mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. So hopefully, the breadth of resources we cover in each one of these sessions will be helpful given the spatial and temporal nature in which you need to operate in your work. As you know, there is a homework associated with this session. You can access that homework through the link provided here, and it is due on May 7th. So with that, we'll now open our question and answer session. Thank you very much. OK, so we're now starting our question and answer. Remember that the way this works is you type in the question, and we will be answering your questions. We'll be going down the list and answering them. And we're creating a document that lists the questions and the answers. And we will be posting this document online. So uh, with us, we also have uh, Dr. Amita Mehta. And she will be helping answer some of the questions. So we'll start with the first one. How often are the socioeconomic data in the CDAC updated? Thank you. Uh, the first question is about how often is socioeconomic data in CDEC updated? And that does depend on which particular data that you're talking about. Uh, so population data, if you go and check, they are uh, almost every five years. Uh, they updated it. Uh, so last one would be 2015, and I think next year there will be a new one. Um, impermeable surface data right now are from 2010, but um, th there is a reference there that you can use satellite data and do your own impervious surface data year by year. So again, um, it depends on the 
on the data set. Many of them are the static data set, um, such as um, reservoirs and dams or um, roads. Right now, they are not changing. But population, of course, is updated. Um, that there are also coastal region map. Uh, they are static for now, I think. So it, you will have to go and check. Each data set provides information when it was updated. Great. So the next question, what is the resolution of the SRTM digital elevation model available? So SRTM is available at one arc second, which is approximately 30 meter resolution for a global product. And that means it goes from about 56 degrees north to about 56 degrees south. What characteristics, question number three, what characteristics of the SMAP microwave sensor radar band so the SMAP microwave sensor is a passive radiometer operating at L band. So that would be uh, 1.2 uh, gigahertz. And SMAP has, by the way, global coverage every three days and it's measuring the surface soil moisture. Um, so that's the soil moisture in the top five centimeters of the soil. How, no, a question number four, how to use MODIS data for cases that the area was not previously dry, not flooded, but saturated soil? I'll let uh, Dr. Meta answer this one. Um, so that's, I, there's no clear answer to that. Uh, partly because optical reflectance will be sensitive to soil moisture, but not as much as a microwave sensor would be. So when you uh, take difference with reference soil, um, you might see uh, saturated, uh, saturated area, so there is more soil moisture, um, it probably will up, up after certain saturation, it might show some signal of flooding, but usually um, I don't think optical reflectance will be that much sensitive to soil moisture as much as the soil color would be. And soil color changes a little bit with saturation. So it, it, the combination of soil moisture plus what soil type is, that's what I, I think. And um, uh, we can look for some references if that study has been done. but. Uh, Clearly, uh, microwave, of course, would clearly be affected by soil moisture for the emissivity changes, but reflectivity is less sensitive, I believe, in optical reflectivity. But we will uh, go back and check this answer and let you know. So question number five, what kind of NASA products or byproducts can be used for medium to small scale watersheds that mainly produce flash flood events? That's a tough one because flash flood events tend to be so quick. Uh, but Dr. Mehta? Yeah, GPM I merge precipitation is every half hour. And so that's that's one data that that is available globally, and um, it's every half hour. So that's the um, highest temporal resolution observed from satellite right now. Um, alternatively, you can use this precipitation to force a high-resolution hydrologic model, and. Um, that can give you more frequent watershed level information. Again, uh, the resolution here is about 10 kilometers, so of IMERGE is about 10 kilometers. So it is, um, it, that depends on how big the watershed is that you're talking about.
Great. So can we download tiles from NRT global flood mapping? Yes, you can. Question seven, are there any resources to find such satellite based flood inundation products going into past events apart from real time use? Uh, yes, actually GFMS and Modis NRT, they do go back in past. So I think 2013 onwards, both of these data are available. 12 or 13 years. Might even go back to 2000 as when the stream started. I can check that and let you know. So, yes, past data are available. And DFO, the Dartmouth Flood Observatory that you just saw, that has a catalog of past floods also. And once you know that, you can go back and see which satellite data are available then. Great, the next one, is there any data set that will give depth of standing water, i.e. flood depth? Uh, so GFMS um, provides flood depth. If we just saw the demonstration from Dr. Potas, um, that does provide flood depth and that is with, with respect to climatological reference stream flow. So again, uh, global flood monitoring system from University of Maryland, that is the one that provides flood depth. Currently, it's available at 25 kilometer, uh, 12 and a half kilometer resolution based on WIC model. Okay, is there any data set that will give depth of standing water flood depth? So that relates, that's. Yeah, that's um, GFMS can provide uh, that flood depth information. Is there any source from where I can download monthly accumulated flood with with it respective high with its respective high? Uh, is there any source from where I can? Um, you can download monthly accumulated precipitation, but not really uh, flood depth. You will have to download the data and do that calculation by yourself. Question 11. How is the financial loss analyzed or measured in such cases of disasters? Is it post hoc case to case basis or a general analysis? Um, I think it is case to case, case by case basis. And so based on that, there may be regional generalization, but it, it is really information that if you look at past disasters and then resulting uh, damage or economic losses, and based on that, uh, you can relate disaster intensity and economic losses statistically. But it has the, the data come from case by case. Question number 12, can we download the tiles for droughts as well? Um, so for the US, there is US drought monitor. Um, there are also indices available there are like uh, Palmer Drought Index or Standardized Palmer Drought Index. Um, those are SPI, uh, Standardized Precipitation Index. These may be available globally, but not sure whether you can download globally. US, for sure, you can look at Drought, drought Monitor. 
Question number 12. Can we down, uh, sorry, uh, 13. Which products can I use for assessing landslide susceptibility? Actually, the next session, which is the last one of this uh, uh, webinar series, is focused on landslides and earthquakes. And we'll talk about products that will inform on uh, uh, risks of landslides. And that session will be next Tuesday, April 30th at the same time. Question number 14, when making a flood risk assessment map, how are different parameters like elevation, soil moisture, and impervious surfaces weighed? Um, top of my head, I don't know, but uh, WRI, Aqueduct, might have references which can give you some indication of how these are weighted. Question number 15, since SAR has the capacity to be utilized regardless of clouds, what is the limitation on its usage for it not being utilized more compared to other types of remote sensing techniques? So the primary limitation is really the temporal repeat um, and the lack of freely available SAR data until recently with the Sentinel-1 SAR data sets. So Sentinel-1 has a 12-day temporal repeat. Now there's Sentinel-1A and B, and so between both of them, it's a six-day temporal repeat. Question number 16, is there any data set for avalanche monitoring on the mountains? So I think when we talk about landslide, um, we probably will touch on that, but um, I think there is a landslide tool, experimental tool that may provide information about um, landslide over mountain regions. Say. And we'll talk about it next week. Okay, so I don't see any more questions. However, I'm taking a look at the uh, chat uh, box and there are a couple of other additional things. Uh, someone asked, My question is that for Pakistan, from where can I get soil moisture data? So if you go to the National Snow and Ice Data Center, or you go to Worldview, for example, you can get uh, soil moisture data for Pakistan. It's a global data set. Can we get database satellite from Central America? I'm not sure what sort of data you're referring to, but uh, the products presented today are uh, uh, global products, uh, which cover Central America as well. How can we download the videos of this webinar? NASA RCEP posts these videos on YouTube and also through the RCEP webpage. Okay. So, Okay, one more question here. How can we get the rainfall time series data for countries other than the US? Um, yeah, so all the data sets that we talked about, TRIM and GPM, rainfall, they are um, global between, TRIM is between 50 south and 50 north and GPM between 65 south and 65 north. So you can get time series of these data. 
anywhere uh, between these latitudes globally. Okay, uh, are there any plans for new global elevation data sets at NASA or other organizations with better resolution hydrological corrections? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, there are other DMs, like there are DMs that have been produced from Tandem X, for example, um, which are not freely available, uh, but at, are at much higher resolution. Um, yeah, so I think LIDAR based and commercial satellite based DM are available, which are higher resolution, but they're commercial data. Okay, so that looks like it for the questions. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Remember, this is uh, part two of three. We have one more series, Landslides and Earthquakes, next Tuesday, April 30th at the same time. Don't forget the homework assignment. So there is a homework associated with today's session, and it is due two weeks from now. So in order for you to get your certificate of completion at the end, you must uh, complete the homework, all homeworks. So thank you very much, and we will uh, see you or uh, talk to you next week. A great day to everyone. Bye-bye.